God be with you all, and welcome to this celebration of Holy Eucharist on this, the 22nd Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost. Uh, for those of you who are here for the first time in a while, uh, we um, have the entire service printed in the bulletin, and um, including all the hymns, unless, of course, you'd like a larger uh, music version of the hymnal, in which case you could go back and, and the sides people would be happy to give you one of those. We begin with the greeting uh, down about halfway on page two of your booklet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit uh, be with you all. And also with you. We pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. as we stand together, let us pray. Lord God, our Redeemer, who heard the cry of your people and sent your servant Moses to lead them out of slavery, free us from the tyranny of sin and death, and by the leading of your Spirit, bring us to our promised land. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Job. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, 
but now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jeremiah, Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapak. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations. And Job died old and full of days. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Hebrews. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But Jesus holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They came to Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bar Timaeus, the son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out, and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many, many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, call him here. And they called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. of us a word from your word in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the psalmist says, many are the troubles of the righteous. Tuck that one away. I wonder if you've heard this one. A friend of mine uh, sent it to me, and apparently a country band called Rascal Flats sings a song about it. Starts with a question. What happens when you play a country song backwards? You get your house back, you get your dog back, you get your best friend Jack back, you get your hair back, your truck back, you get your first and second wives back, your front porch swing, your pretty little thing, your bling, 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 and your diamond ring. You get your farm and the barn and the boat and the Harley. First night in jail with Charlie, sounds a little crazy. A little scattered and absurd, but that's what you get when you play a country song backwards. <laughs> and if you think about it, um, though the terms might be a little bit different, it's kind of what happens to long-suffering and misunderstood old Job, and even to Bartimaeus, who was made famous by our gospel, which tells about the great gift he got back uh, in his encounter with Jesus. Now, I don't know if you're a country fan, and I hope I didn't offend any country fans there, um, but uh, if we forget about the kinds of things that country singers sing about, and just think about loss and restoration, it's very tempting to jump to the conclusion when you hear stories like we heard in the scriptures today, that after hardship and loss, 
the power and presence of God to bring restoration and renewal, healing and comfort and help comes to a, um, a holy few like magic. If you believe, as some people think and still teach, if you live a clean life, if you walk the right path, then, so the saying goes, whatever you lose, whatever harm or disease or, or hurt came your way in the past, well, God will just take it all away. And you will be blessed and prosper in this world like never before. And of course, the corollary of that is, if you don't get blessed, healed, have your loved ones or your stuff restored, well, you, you mustn't be a good believer or a, a clean living person. But that's not our experience, is it? And it's not what we believe as Christians. Any more than we can find in the book of Job the solution for the mystery of suffering or some secret to understanding um, how there can be a loving God and a powerful God when at the same time there's so much evil and suffering going on in the world. Now Job, you may know, spends most of the book that bears his name railing against God and complaining. Uh, once you get past about chapter 4, for about 35 chapters, it just goes on and on and on. And, um, and if you're reading that and you're in a bad place, it can be helpful because you feel the way he feels. And there it is right in scripture as it is often in the Psalms. And in the end, we're told after all that loss and suffering, Job actually doesn't get all the answers. He confesses that he still doesn't have the answers, but he comes to see a truth that many miss. And we're told God also rewards him. All his friends miss that truth, by the way, when they come to console Job. Um, but end up in one way or another saying, you know, you must have done something wrong. Just tell God you're sorry and it'll get fixed. Um, uh, but he didn't do anything wrong. Um, he didn't do anything wrong to lose seven sons and three daughters, homes and estates and animals and land and respect and finally his health. Uh, we know, and our mothers have taught us, that we can bring suffering or pain on ourselves and on others. We can actually be responsible for that. But Job's suffering is not a result of God's punishment for something he did. It's simply unfair, unjust suffering. And it happens to Job and it, it can happen to any of us. So is a lot of what happens in our broken world. It just happens. Believing and trusting in God, as the psalmist says for today, does not mean we won't suffer. I wonder if you know that line from the movie, one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride, where the princess says, you mock my pain. And though she doesn't know who he is, the hero says, Highness, life is pain. Anyone who tells you anything different is selling something. <laughs> Job knows pain only too well, as many of us do. And in the end, as we read today, God tells him, he doesn't understand uh, uh, what's going on, but then he rewards him and blesses him in new ways anyway. And we get a glimpse into Job's renowned faith. I wonder if you noticed um, uh, one of the things he does. I, I missed it until I read it, uh, heard it this morning at 8 o'clock. He prays for those friends who were so horrible to him. That's like the second to last thing that he does. And God hears those prayers for his uh, not very kind friends. And, um, and we're left now with a long story uh, to which too many of us, I believe, uh, can relate. Um, but we, we don't get a lot of answers about God or suffering, and we don't get a secret formula for uh, future prosperity. We do get one good thing. Um, I don't know if you noticed this as well in the, in the Job reading. Um, uh, Job's beautiful daughters are the only people he names. <laughs> Sons, shmuns, you hear three daughters and all their all their, they're, they're all named and they're given equal inheritance with their brothers uh, from their dad's restored wealth. Th that would have been absolutely unheard of. In Job's day, 
or, or for generations that followed. And of course, still in parts of the world, it is unheard of. So that's something unlooked for in the story of Job. Now, Job is not the only one who hangs in there and gets something back in the word for today. We also meet, as I said earlier, Bar Timaeus, who has suffered a great loss. He wasn't born blind. Um, uh, and as often happens, um, his suffering means he's counted out by other people. <clears throat> happens all the time, of course. Uh, he doesn't get 35 chapters of a biblical book to make his case for God's attention and redress. He gets shouted down and told to be quiet. He gets pushed aside by people who essentially say, listen, blind man, don't be crying out to Jesus for help. He's busy. Who do you think you are? And don't you know how important Jesus is? He has more important things to do to, than to listen to or pay attention to the likes of you. Now, if that wasn't such a sad statement, um, it'd almost be funny. Because, you know, I have heard people say that um, uh, of themselves uh, and to themselves for 35 years. Uh, over and over again, who am I? people say. Why should I expect any help from God or any relief in my situation? And besides, boy, I hear this one a lot. There are probably more important people than me. People more, uh, worse off than me. I get that a lot. Um, people more worthy of help or success or relief than me. Wonderfully, though, the son of Timaeus doesn't stop crying out even though people say that of him. He cries even louder, we're told, and he shouts again that political, religious, and holy little title to get Jesus' attention. Son of David, have mercy on me. Now all this happened after Jesus had tried and tried and then tried again uh, to get his closest friends and followers to understand who he was and what he came to do. For us. It's so important that we've been reading about it for the last four Sundays in a row, this wonderful section in the middle of Mark's gospel. Um, again and again and again, the disciples uh, get it wrong. It's a little threefold pattern that happens three times. They miss the point, they do something or say something that shows they're missing the point, and then Jesus teaches them more about love and sacrifice and the grace that he came to bring us. And Mark is not just content to let us figure this out for ourselves. No, he gives us a pretty uh, great clues. He has these two stories, a kind of bookmarks of people being healed of blindness on both ends. People who come to see on both sides. So these two men get the gift of sight before and after the stories about the disciples not getting it or seeing it for themselves. So now today when we meet the second of those two so-called blind men, we find someone like many in the world today who has a physical limitation, as many of us do. Somebody at 8 o'clock told me that uh, I was getting old and um, shouldn't um, be surprised if I have problems with, you know, everything. Um, <laughs> I thanked him. Um, uh, it was once thought to be a sign of a flaw in a person, a moral, a serious moral flaw, if you had any kind of physical uh, limitation. And while some, might, uh, uh, some of that thinking might have gone by today, uh, we still think of physical limitations in so many people as what we call crippling disabilities. But Jesus shows us that this blind man is more able to see than the disciples who had had all those times face to face with Jesus to hear his teaching and see his model, his mission, and his identity for them. And they get it wrong, and our Lord corrects them so that they could really start to see. And Jesus hears the so-called blind man calling out to him, and he doesn't see Bartimaeus' physical blindness as a disability at all. When he says, call him here, and I think, rather ridiculously, the crowd changes its tune all of a sudden and says, take heart, get up, Jesus is calling you. Uh, we're told he throws off his cloak, probably the only thing he owns, 
and uh, gropes forward so that our Lord can ask him this great question. What do you want me to do for you? It seems simple, but Jesus doesn't presume to know Bartimaeus' answer to that question. He wants him to say it for himself. It seems uh, uh, that Jesus also doesn't want to impose his power on him. People can tell that he's blind. Jesus could have just, you know, snapped his fingers and given him sight, but he, he wants him to ask this question. And so Bartimaeus says, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus says, go, your faith has made your well. In, a, in an, a way he already saw better than most people. But St. Mark tells us he immediately regained his sight. So he experiences a physical healing and he sees even more. His uh, was not just the end of a supposed disability, but an affirmation of what he was able to see already. And then Mark says, he followed Jesus on the way, which is rather wonderful. Jesus says, go, and he turns around and follows Jesus. Now, I don't know what you would say um, when Jesus asks you this question, because he asks it of all of us. Um, what do you really want me to do for you? What would we say? Would we start with something we don't have? You know, like um, when we were kids and people would say, if you had three wishes, what would you want? Um, and we might start on that level. Um, things that we desire or, or, or want. Um, and um, things that we don't have, perhaps. Uh, thinking about uh, physical health or security or some problems that need solving, as if by magic. Uh, fortune, success or fame. Last week we heard about James and John who were asked the exact same question by Jesus and they answered too quickly. Um, uh, they, they said they wanted the greatest places of honor where the glory of Jesus would kind of rub off on them and, um, and then the other disciples were upset that they didn't think of it first. Um, uh, but what if they had taken a little bit more time, just a few more minutes, to consider the question and had had perhaps a little bit more of Bartimaeus' vision and faith. If you and I took the time, perhaps we would pass through, we'd start off with those wishes, and then we'd cut through them and go deeper and deeper in our wants. Uh, and in time, we might come at, to, to answer the question in this way, as uh, Canon Whitney Rice proposes. Lord, let us see how loved we are. Let us see how hungry for love others are, how worthy of love they are, how precious and beautiful and wonderful our neighbors are. And let us see that all this love comes from you, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and, the God, and God the Creator and the indwelling Spirit. My teacher, let me see. Now, you might come up with some other answers to that question, and I encourage you to do that. Think about that question, take it home with you, pray about it, and if you want, you can come and talk to me and we can pray about it together. But here's one application of this, uh, this question and uh, this gospel for today. For over two years, some of us have been meeting, Zooming, and trying to come up with a plan to create more safe and affordable housing here in Perth. Our first vision, stolen entirely from the early days of the refugee resettlement program in town, was a kind of renovation project where we would approach a landlord, we would renovate and expand their building, and heaven knows there's enough buildings in Perth that need some renovation and expansion, and then we would invite and support some people to come off that uh, 700 plus waiting list in our county to their new home. And our plan was that uh, we would be partners. We wouldn't do it all ourselves. We would be, just like the car, we would be partners with others in the community. But after all this time, we could find one person who wasn't a member of this congregation to join us in developing the plan and, and moving it forward. And it wasn't enough. Uh, we needed a steering committee, just like the executive of the car, uh, who would really relate to one. Lots of people said, listen, when you get that going, let me know. Um, I'll give you money and I'll volunteer. But to get it going, no one has stepped forward, except members of this congregation, as I said, and one other person. 
So I've begun to wonder whether we need new vision. We need to see things better or more. I still believe we can make a difference and have a role in helping with our housing crisis in this town and this county, but maybe there's a different model that we haven't seen yet. A model that will pique the interest of others and cause folks to come forward and be our partners. Or maybe the Lord wants us to move ahead on our own, as we thought it wasn't the goal. It was so easy, it seemed to me, uh, to see our role from 2015 to 2019 uh, with refugee resettlement. And I said then, and I say it still again today, it's not an either or thing, people halfway around the world or local people in need of housing, it's both and. And now it's time for the other, uh, I believe. Um, God prospered that plan and that work that we did for four years, and St. James was a huge partner in that. And now we need to see again. What is the Lord showing us our faith can accomplish? What will be the greatest expression of our faith and our witness to Christ's love to our neighbors? How will we be most truly followers of Jesus? And that's what I'm praying these days. Now, as I said, you might have some other way of answering that question, what do you really want me to do for you? And I encourage you to pursue it. The world, our circumstances or our suffering, and even we might count us out or count us unworthy to answer that question, but Jesus doesn't. Viruses and financial crises at home, so-called natural disasters all over the place, people in power halfway around the world, uh, and quiet, hard-to-hear diagnoses that we hear in our own house or in the house next door still threaten to take things away from us and from so many others. It's tempting either to look for God as somehow in those terrible things as a punisher, which we don't believe, or to wonder where he could be when they come our way. But God is more than what befalls us. God is above and beyond what the created world or its creatures do to one another. And in Jesus, God gave himself to us. And then he invited us to accept his gift to, in some cases, outlast, and in other cases, to stand up under, and still others, even to overcome what comes our way. The God who came to know suffering, and then death, and then resurrection for us, is the same God who today calls us precious, and able, and faithful. And this God invites us to live for others and to see our lives and our next steps in new ways which the world may not understand. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let us confess our faith as we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray with confidence to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. O Lord, guard and direct your church in the way of unity, service, and praise. We pray for openness to hear God's word and to respond to God's call. In our worldwide Anglican communion, we pray today for the extra-provincial churches around the world. We pray for Justin of Canterbury, Linda, our primate, Anne, our metropolitan, Shane, our bishop, Kenneth, our priest, and all who lead and serve in this parish. In our diocesan family, we pray for our upcoming synod, for our diocesan events and communications coordinator, Heidi Fawcett, and for all retired clergy of the Diocese of Ottawa, especially John Fowler, David Smith, Ed Kostick, and Peggy Kuzmitz. Lord, hear our prayer. Give to all nations an awareness of the unity of the human family. We pray for Elizabeth, our queen, and all in authority, for Justin, our prime minister, and for all striving to keep us safe and well. Lord, hear our prayer. Cleanse our hearts of prejudice and selfishness and inspire us to hunger and thirst for what is right. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach us to use your creation for your greater praise, that all may share the good things that you provide. We pray that God would prosper and, and guide us in an affordable housing initiative and move the hearts of many in Perth to support it and volunteer. Lord, hear our prayer. Strengthen all who give their energy or skill for the healing of those who are sick in body or in mind. We pray for all who are in need of God's help and our care. Valerie and Rick Hodgkinson, Linda Carr, Eleanor, Phelan, Ron, Ed, Dorothy, Ruth, Jonathan, Jim, Emmett and his family, Dorothy, Peggy, Cheryl, Ruth, Shane, Brenda, Ted, Linda, Karen, David, Joanne, Lisa, Ken, Janiel, Robin, Peter, Cindy, Betty, Janet, John, and Hillary, Shirley, Peggy, Maureen, Mary, Jimmy, Robert, Mary, Cheryl, Jeff, Helen, Junie, Heather, Betty, Colette, Adam, the Reverend Bill Simons, and all others who are in our hearts today. We pray for all who are sick, in quarantine and self-isolating, and for those who are afraid. Lord, hear our prayer. Set free all who are bound by fear and despair. Lord, Hear our prayer. Grant a peaceful end and eternal rest to all who are dying, and your comfort to those who mourn. We pray for the repose of the souls of Clark Hodgkinson, Herbert Roy Carr, and all who have died in this pandemic, and for those who died this past night. Lord, hear our prayer.
We continue in prayer with the general confession. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Would you stand and stay where you are, but greet those nearby with the peace of Christ. As we stand together, let us offer ourselves and these gifts as we say, God of constant love, you have guided your people in all times and ages. May we who offer you our praise today always be ready to follow where you lead. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's share a word about communion before we consecrate the elements today. I'm going to try today to um, have one of the sides people come forward but stand near that pillar on your left uh, on the side aisle. 
And uh, if the congregation would follow their lead either with a nod or a hand wave or something to come forward and wait until all the choir has received communion and returned to their places, then we should avoid some of our kind of running into each other. Now remind us all, you come forward either as an individual or a household or a couple and stand on the white crosses and don't move forward until the person in front of you has moved forward. Um, uh, you're not going to make things go any faster by pushing from behind. And, um, and then when you come to the altar, you stand either as an individual or a family group on one of the four crosses and, and uh, we'll offer you the bread and if you wish the wine for communion, we'll say the words of administration for both. You can also come forward for blessing. And of course, we ask that when you return to your seats that you follow the, uh, the arrows, which will take you down the side aisle and back up the center aisle. Uh, or down the, uh, the far side if you go out this way. Hope that's clear. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image, male and female you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, his perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death. By raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, 
with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. God, our guide, you have fed us with bread from heaven as you fed the people of Israel. May we who have been inwardly nourished be ready to follow you all our days. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Know that when God looks at you, he sees how precious you are, how able you are, and he sees your faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Will you be seated, please? <clears throat> well, thank you to uh, all of you and to uh, Sandra. Uh, I thought communion went really well. That was great. What we were hoping for. I wanted to begin by saying a word of special thanks to uh, all those who contributed towards and then worked so hard at our beef dinner. Um, 167 or 169 people, uh, meals were served. Um, so that's uh, pretty terrific. And, um, and of course, if you were one of those people who either bought a ticket or bought a ticket and, and picked up food, that, that's really great. You were supporting um, uh, the first of our, our big fall events uh, sponsored by our guild in support of the ministries of our parish. And, um, and that's really great. You know, we've been praying for and looking forward to uh, restarting our children and youth ministries. Uh, so far, Sue Sams and, uh, and Tori have come forward to say that they would teach in our new godly play uh, kind of restart. And Sandy Scriver has offered to do training for anybody who wishes. And we're looking for two more people so that each person will only serve once a month. Uh, and um, so if that's something you'd like to learn more about or uh, grow into, uh, then please come and speak with me or call, call uh, the office and uh, we'll, we'll connect. Love to be able to start that in November. Uh, also, of course, um, it's time for us to restart our pastoral care uh, team, um, more than just me. So um, we're going to have our meeting on the first Thursday in November. And uh, so uh, there's already one new person, well, really two new people joining that ministry. And I'm going to invite all the people who participated in, in the past, if they're comfortable doing so, uh, to help me to begin to expand our ministry. And um, I'm going to be sending you a letter uh, shortly, but um, I had a conversation with someone this week. You know, last year we did an awful lot of things, and I, I write about these in the, in the, um, in the uh, letter that you'll receive later in the week, but um, uh, to stay connected. Uh, the first was, of course, an every member telephone ministry, which I thought was wonderful and, and really bore a lot of fruit and reached a lot of people, some people we hadn't been connected to for years. And then we have reduced that now to sort of a select group of about 50 people who we are kind of concerned about, people who are on their own, uh, people who just have asked for a regular phone call. And there's a hearty group of, of uh, uh, five or six people who are doing that phoning uh, still. Um, but. Um, we want to stay connected. We want the people who are not with us here on Sunday morning, uh, some of whom are watching us on YouTube, to know that we miss them. And uh, we'd love to see them back here. We're allowed 100 people, and I, I don't exactly know what the number was today, but it was somewhere shy of 60, I think. So we've got room, and we're looking forward to the day when we can get 56. There you go. We can, we can get rid of these tapes on the pews. So it sounds like masks are going to be with us for a little while longer. Um, and so uh, we've, we've got room to grow, and, uh, but wonderful to see so many out. As I, I keep saying to members of St. James, more so than in many other parishes in the diocese, indeed most parishes in the diocese. So um, uh, I'm very pleased with the way our congregation is supporting each other and, and um, firing back uh, into uh, uh, worship and service and, and other ways. Uh, there's a note at the end of the bulletin, or maybe the order of service, can't remember where Brenda put it. Um, because of a series of letters that went back and forth with the Archdeacon of the Diocese, I read secondhand that though we're not allowed to have coffee, we're not allowed to serve 
refreshments where people take their masks off uh, because of what other people were doing, um, we are actually allowed to have fellowship. <laughs> so we could actually gather around a table downstairs with masks on and catch up a bit after church. If that's something you'd like to do, either today, I'm happy to stick around myself, um, or, uh, or in future weeks, let me know, and then we'll just start putting that in the bulletin. Those who wish to gather after the service, you know, we'll meet downstairs in the hall, and uh, God willing, soon that will include refreshments once again, and, uh, and so I commend that to you. Um, there was something else I wanted to share with you. One other, well, this week is Synod. So we have our Synod service on Thursday night, which you can watch uh, uh, virtually. Some of us have tickets to be there in person. And, um, and then on Saturday is the uh, actual Synod of the Diocese. It's just, I think, four hours, uh, which we're not unhappy about. And, um, and it's all on Zoom, so you can you know, let your camera go to uh, blank and have a sandwich or go to the bathroom or, you know. But, you know, you'll, we'll be there. Our, our members of Synod will be there, right, Janet? We'll, we'll be there, yeah. Um, and we've had two pre-synod meetings already, so we're well equipped for that, for that meeting when it comes this Saturday. And so uh, please pray for that gathering. And if you can, and you can watch the service uh, on the cathedral's uh, website and feed on Thursday night at 7 o'clock, you get to hear the bishop's charge, which is normally, you know, only the people who go to synod get to hear it. And I always look forward to hearing uh, Bishop Shane speak, so uh, do um, uh, make a note of that. Uh, we have Al-Anon and AA uh, starting to meet again here at St. James. We have Pickleball starting up four days a week, uh, which will, will also provide some rather substantial income to the parish. Um, we're letting our building be used by the Friends of the Library once a month. Um, you know we have our choir practice. A piano lesson is starting to happen here in church, so things are going on. And of course, there are notes on the... Uh, Jingle Bell Bazaar coming up there. Um, I don't know, how many people uh, saw the boxes for desserts for the, for the um, uh, roast beef dinner? Did you see that? Very cleverly, boy, we have some smart people in the parish. There was a sticker on top of the apple pie, which would have gotten my attention anyway, on the apple pie box, uh, telling you about the Jingle Bell Bazaar. I thought, man, these people are on the ball. Um, so, because um, there have been a lot of people who are not members of the parish as well who were getting that uh, wonderful roast beef dinner. So, uh, that's, that's really great. And of course, it will be a virtual event, um, kind of creatively put together, and I, and I know many will support it and are already working hard on it. So, I commend that to you. And uh, stay tuned for more information about um, the youth drama group and uh, the uh, Bible study in the pub. God willing, starting in November. Are there any other... Oh, I wanted to say, where's Diane? Hi, Diane. I hope you saw the email that Brenda sent out with that wonderful photograph. Congratulations to Diane for winning the, the uh, Perry Award uh, this year. <laughs> you can't have gone to the theater downtown in the last many years without seeing Diane. So uh, uh, that's, that's rather wonderful that, that she gets that recognition. Any, anything else? Any other announcements? Well, today, as you know, unless you wanted to uh, kick back in the, in the parish hall, uh, you're invited to follow the arrows and not stop on your way out. Um, and um, we're going to sing our concluding hymn, if I can find it in my bulletin here. Well, the number won't help me, just I need to know the name. <laughs> Praise the one who breaks the darkness.
Thanks be to God.